Well, uh, good afternoon. Whoa. Uh, my name is Jonathan Citrin, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our lunch about Frank Pasquale's amazing book on the Black Box Society. Uh, I should alert you from the start that this is being webcast live, so hello to everybody out there on the internet at large, and will be archived for the ages, so anything you say will be used against you later in the comments fields. Um, but uh, as far as a Twitter stream uh, goes, uh, we recommend uh, hashtag BBS, as in Black Box Society, and uh, we'll see if we can wrest it from those who like bulletin board services. Um, I have been looking forward to this day for quite a while. Frank has been thinking about these issues for quite a while. With Oren Braca, he wrote a piece in 2006, was it? Uh, it published 2008. Published in 2008. Yes. So it probably had a gestation that went yes. before that. Uh, uh, as I described it last week on the title, Federal Search Commission? Question uh, mark. And then had, of course, the obligatory subtitle that went on for a while. Um, <laughs> And uh, it did uh, observe Betteridge's law of headlines, for which if there's a question in the headline, the answer is usually no. But uh, it, it was the first salvo broaching the subject, particularly with respect to search engines, of what's going into the secret sauce and to what extent is that a concern societally. And I think it's fair to say when it was published, it was met... It, it, the society wasn't ready to hear your message yet when you published <laughs> that. And uh, a lot has changed since 2008. There's a lot of conversation going on across multiple disciplines uh, about the algorithms that run our lives. And uh, this is now the book uh, to read about exactly that subject. So uh, what we thought we would do is uh, simply have a conversation to get started between us and then open it up uh, to anybody who wants to participate. And we have a mic so you can be properly on the record. And uh, we're off to the races. Uh, you should also be aware books are for sale in the corner of the room um, at no surcharge over the sticker <laughs> price. So you can get it for exactly the price advertised uh, on the book, which is not on the book. So whatever it is, it is a value at twice the tax -free. price. Tax-free? It is tax-free. It's $30, which is less than the ticket price. Oh, well, look at that. It is $30. So And also less than Amazon. Let the revolution begin. So, um, so uh, Frank, let's get right into it. Uh, this is a book that defies a bumper sticker or a tweet. It's got so much going on in it in a good way. Um, how do you want to lay out the path of the observations you're making? And of course, you have not just everybody complaining about the weather, but some ideas about what to do about it. So, Sure. So thank you so much for that generous yes. introduction. And I wanted to say that I guess the way that I would lay out the path of the book, um, I'll talk about something that's sort of happening right now and then get into the exact structure of the book. What's really exciting to me about what's happening now is that we're seeing the emergence of a new academic field, or at least a new academic problem area, of algorithmic accountability. And I think if you look at conferences like the ones that were recently at NYU, organized by Helen Nissenbaum and some of her uh, colleagues there, she brings together computer scientists, attorneys, sociologists, social scientists, all of whom I think have some insight, some angle onto the problem of how do you make uh, social processes that are largely driven by algorithms more accountable to the people that they affect. And you know, I see that sort of interdisciplinary movement a lot here at Berkman. I mean, I always listen to the podcast feed and I, I hear these really interesting voices from law, from social science, from, from computer science. And I think this emerging field of academic, of algorithmic accountability, it exemplifies something that uh, political scientist Ian Shapiro calls problem-driven as opposed to purely method-driven research. I think so often academic research can sort of become somewhat involuted if it's only concerned with, say, the, the uh, methods of one particular field. And I think a way to make a more engaged uh, and relevant uh, public sphere for academics is to do things like engage with algorithmic accountability. So in my I, book, I'm trying to do that. Oh, oh yeah. I was just going to ask uh, up front, uh, it should we define what an algorithm is? Because sure. it is a kind of $10 <laughs> word, and yes. uh, 
uh, when attached to accountability, it's a lot of syllables. I think it was Nicholas Diakopoulos who uh, yes. <laughs> coined the phrase. But what, what's an algorithm? So I would say that sort of the, the best layman's approach to algorithm is to consider a recipe and how, for example, you might bake a cake according to, say, a recipe that you download online or find in a cookbook or something like that, a set procedure that's followed according to a number of steps. Now, to take this from the uh, positivist to a more normative approach to algorithms, it was often promised among algorithmic processes that they would be more objective, more fair, more neutral than, say, a human-driven process. So for example, with credit scoring, that was thought to be originally a much more fairer way to people because rather than having, say, the prejudices of an individual who's making a decision about someone in front of them, you would have the algorithm, which would be more objective and neutral. But as the book tries to show, and I think other researchers show, a lot of times that's not the case. A lot of times people's biases can be programmed into an algorithm or can be reflected in that. I wonder if we shouldn't dwell for a moment just on credit scores in particular, not okay. feel totally obliged to immediately go into internet-y stuff or, or uh, internet-focused stuff. Um, so tell us a little bit about the credit score. And in 2015, what problems you see within it, how big they are, and what you would do to fix it while still being able to process lots of people's applications for credit in some way that makes sense? That's the key question, right? I mean, one of the key questions is, do we assume that we must, that the algorithmically driven processes, which are characterized by speed and scale, must continue to be done in an automated fashion? And I think that a lot of times the battle of this book is sort of, it's a battle over that line between where we trust things to be entirely automated versus where we need some human intervention or human judgment. So with credit scores, you know, I mean, I'll just give a, a story that was related to me by a businessman who read the book. And I've, I've been very happy about the number of business people that have sort of been interested in the book because I think it talks about a lot of dilemmas they face. Uh, there was a businessman who essentially w decided to go uh, take a lawsuit against a uh, cemetery which had been misusing the funds that were allocated to it for preserving the grave sites. Okay? And long story short, I mean, they, the cemetery clearly should have uh, been acting in a much more responsible ma manner. But at one point in the lawsuit, he failed to do the standing right, or he didn't get that right as an attorney, and he got a judgment against him. That judgment has in turn translated into really knocking down his credit score. Okay. So his score now is something that's like, I mean, it was knocked down by 150 or 200 points. And when you're thinking about, say, buying Manhattan real estate, this business was, this businessman was in New York, that can translate into a big cost on your mortgage and other things. It translates for a big cost into others for credit as well. Now, to come to the, you know, the, the numb of the point, I think if we were still doing credit scoring via, say, a more uh, uh, according to more human judgment, according to a more narrative approach where people can explain themselves. And for example, if you look at Charles Tilley's book, Why, which talks about various forms of people explaining one another and, and trying to understand human action, I think in that case, you know, he could explain, hey, look, I was overall working for justice. Yes, I messed up at this point of the case. Maybe you shouldn't you know, penalize me so much and put me in, say, the bottom 20% of borrowers for this particular loan application or something. But when it's all done by a score, so often you know, that scoring system is immune to, say, the appeals to normative appeals, more narrative appeals, and things like that. Would, I think that sort of is, is one of the critiques in the book. I would, think. You, yeah. would you have, in that instance, would you have it be a so-called one-way ratchet so that if you have somebody that the score is good on, but the officer gets a funny feeling about, possibly driven by who knows what kind of bias, that the score should trump because that would lead to credit. You know, it's, uh, I, I don't want the one-way bias. And actually, the Talzarski has done interesting work about making sure that not only are there ways to challenge, say, the bad credit score, but there are interesting institutional ways to encode challenges to good credit scores. So to the extent that, say, you were going to devolve responsibility for credit decisions to loan officers on an individual basis, perhaps they'd have that type of, of prerogative. But I think to get to the larger point about uh, within the book and about some of the solutions, I mean, if you look at the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that to me, and for many privacy activists, uh, has been a model of how you would uh, try to make 
big data-driven systems more responsive to the concerns of people who say feel that they've been discriminated against or that the data doesn't fairly reflect them. So if you look at the Fair Credit Reporting Act, admittedly that has not been perfectly implemented, or it hasn't been well implemented, I would say, by the large credit bureaus like Experian, TransUnion, et cetera, but at least it's some sort of template response. And so what the book looks at in chapter five is ways of making sure that it's really vindicated and that it really is uh, that the protections to inspect, correct, and annotate certain for records about oneself are, are there and are actually vindicated. And by the way, I mean, one gratifying moment this year was that Attorney General Eric Schneiderman actually recently entered into a settlement with the three major credit bureaus. Okay. And that, I think, was a major success in terms of making, uh, creating a foundation for algorithmic accountability in the future. Now, this leads immediately to a sort of uh, more procedural than substantive question or set of objections that you might be likely and probably already have heard, mm -hmm. which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1972 was really written against a landscape of uh, big computers like you know, mini computers or mainframes owned by TRW, Equifax, <laughs> one of a handful of credit bureaus that can afford the compliance officers, the lawyers. They, they have a relationship with the government. And as a percentage of their business, dealing with compliance is not a big deal. In a landscape of today, where algorithms are embedded into everything, and you have all sorts of things, whether it's Uber or um, Airbnb or, or other services that are doing matching, but maybe starting as very small startups, how readily can the kinds of burdens that might be placed on the big guys be translated down to two business school students really want to start something up? Do they have to worry somehow about how they're going to interact with consumers so they don't get sued under a new kind of FICRA? Excellent. So, I mean, and, I, and that's what I love about the Berkman Center interviews, you get right to the hard questions. So, one of the hard questions is, you know, do you impose this as a regulatory burden on the small people as opposed to, say, the larger ones? In a piece called The Scored Society that I co-authored with Daniel Keat Citron, we have a portion of that where we try to define, say, what is a data broker? Who would be subject to the types of regulations that we would propose? Um, now, what I think is, a, and so we try to say that like, there's a certain minimum size of entity. You could make it a, a, a market cap of 50 million, 100 million. I don't really care how big that is, but I think that you know, when something's as big as Uber, yeah, I think it starts qualifying for something like that. And I think that you know, if you happen to be someone that has suddenly gotten a one-star review um, based and something that's ultimately arbitrary and capricious. Part of extending principles of technological due process, especially in an era of technologically driven monopolies, as we're witnessing in so many of these fields, is to include that type of protection. What I think is the more interesting question, though, is for, say, the individual who's facing 4,000 data brokers, right? I mean, there, may, there, there are, I did a piece for the New York Times in October that was about the problems that individuals face as they you know, they're not only potentially being defamed or characterized as uncreditworthy by three major credit bureaus, now there are literally thousands of agencies that have data about you and that could potentially be saying that, and these are practical, I mean, real examples, that the person is probably bipolar, is depressed, is suffering from diabetes, will likely cost a lot in medical care, et cetera. Okay, when that happens, I think that we have to have a whole new regulatory infrastructure, and part of that would be that you would enable people, say, to have, to, to tell, that you would have a centralized clearinghouse where entities that create these types of lists and classifications would have to report on their doing so, and people would be able to request that when they got classified as such, they would hear about it. Now, of course, maybe they'll just be spam, maybe there'll be too many, but at least we would have our, a handle on the size of the problem. And that, to me, is the key, right? The key is that this is the type of problem. That's why I titled the book Black Box, you know, the Black Box Society. We don't even have a handle on the scope and size of the problem of, say, how many people are being classified as ill, how is that affecting them in various judgments that can be made by online data brokers or ad markets or other things, how they might respond. We don't even have a handle on that very basic issue. But, but yeah. to answer your own question, then, about where to draw the line as to who is or isn't a data broker, right. the line would be drawn fairly broadly. It would, it would circumscribe many, many yeah. entities as data brokers. And here's my justification for that, which comes from my background in health information privacy law. So in chapter five of the book, one of my models for regulating the new sort of wild west of runaway data comes directly from HIPAA 
and more recently the 2009 Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, and its uh, clarification in the 2013 Omnibus HIPAA rule. Okay. And HIPAA now, is? Oh, this is the um, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which incidentally regulates privacy. Right? <laughs> and this is important to know the history, right? The history is that in 1996, we get this health privacy law, but that a large reason why it was driven was in order to encourage the electronic processing of insurance claims, right? Similarly, in 2009, we get massive subsidies for electronic health records, but we've got to have additional health privacy protections put on top of that. This, to me, is one of the very few deeply encouraging examples of, a, or it's one of, one of actually many, I'm sorry, one of many deeply encouraging examples of government trying to condition certain forms of subsidy for technological advance on the protection of human values such as privacy, right? And, and I think that's where, in terms of health information privacy, that's a much more advanced regime than we have now. And here's why I would apply it to data brokers and to even companies classified as data brokers. If Target can determine that you're pregnant, Okay, like we all know this story, right? This is the, the story from, from Charles Duhigg who, who classified, who showed how Target had a database of the known pregnant and then compared via big data and out pattern matching their um, purchases to all their other customers. And so basically they know that like, it's amazing the granularity in which they can sort of use your purchases to predict that say you're in the sixth month of pregnancy in the Atlanta area and you're about 26 or something, okay? If Target and entities like that can predict with such targeted precision, the likelihood of medical conditions among their clientele, then to me, they start entering into the zone where they have to be treated like we treat the covered entities under HIPAA, providers, the doctors, the hospitals, and other entities. And is the idea then that they just shouldn't tell anybody what they discover, but they're entitled to discover it, and they should tell the person in question, this just in, we think you're pregnant. <laughs> Check a box to tell us if you're not. Uh, is that, I mean, because that's sort of what the FICRA analog would be, right? I mean, I think that we, we're going to have to suss it out. We're going to suss it out over decades. But here's what I think would be a more intuitively appealing um, implementation of this type of approach, which would be, for example, I could create in the clearinghouse that would be either government maintained or perhaps even by a non-governmental organization, perhaps even the Berkman Center could maintain it. Um, you could have it this clearinghouse. I could approach the clearinghouse. I, this I was not ready to move off the lot yet. <laughs> <laughs> I remember stop badware. So I, know guys, so, I mean, you, you could have this sort of thing where I would say, I want to know if any, any entity thinks I'm a criminal, right? Because that actually is something where there are a lot of entities that you might, that might be the sensitive information to you that you want to be alerted to. And I have an example of my book about someone who was falsely accused of being a meth dealer. Yeah. And she finally found out that that was why she couldn't get housing, she couldn't get a dishwasher, she couldn't get so a job. So let's just play you this see? out. So okay. Target is like, uh, I think you're a criminal. Okay. Okay, what happens next? Then I get, a right, I get a right similar to either the FICRA or the HIPAA regime to inspect, correct, and annotate that. And uh, what I inspect is it says, I think you're a criminal. Okay. And then you send like a letter in high dudgeon that takes some time to write, or maybe right. one of the reputation services helps you draft it that says, like, I am not a crook. <laughs> and then if you win, Target's like, okay, you're not a criminal. Okay. And, and I think that's a, that's a better regime than where they could just be keeping this on file about me and it's a sort of free-floating lie. I'm just walking down the aisle at Target and I'm like, they're looking at me so <laughs> um, But one thing to think about is like, yeah. you may be a worker applying to Target, right? I mean, you could, I mean this, there's so many ways in which you know, this type of information could be... Good opening line um, in a Target interview, I am not a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> but can I talk about the First Amendment implications? Because that's really interesting too, right? I mean, because one idea here is that Target is going to use cases like... Uh, they're going to use First Amendment cases to say, I have a right to gather certain data about you, and I have a right to characterize you in certain ways. So that, again, is this huge tension that the book tries to address yes. too briefly. But, you know, I mean, I try to address in, in, a, in a way that can draw people into the debate how, for example, you'd reconcile Target's First Amendment right to uh, gather information about you and characterize you versus your right to guarantee that this is accurate and yes. that it's not unduly defaming you. Yes. I want to bring Dan Gear into the conversation. Dan Gear um, posted a note to the cryptography list uh, a little while ago, and I'm just going to quote briefly okay. from it. He says, and I wish I could get his courtly lilt, um, we cannot, nor should we waste effort trying to, serially forbid collections by name or by type. We can only sabotage the process, and for that, <laughs> I see only two paths, both of which need labor now or never. One, 
changing liability law so substantially as to make casual data acquisition more akin to stockpiling lethal chemicals, the combination of which grows exponentially dangerous as their varieties increase, and two, requiring the public and private sectors alike to, in every detail, offer their services to persons whose technological high point is links with neither cookies nor remote procedure calls. Anybody remember links? <laughs> yeah. Is somebody using it right now? Um, a kind of parallel to how we now require structural and procedural accommodations to handicapped persons. Both one and two are as impossible as reaching the North Star, but they must be that by which we navigate. Curious your reaction to those two suggestions. Uh, it was very eloquently put. Um, and, I, and in chapter five of the book, to go to the liability concerns, I do cite some of the EU folks uh, who, um, I believe it's Neely Crows or another uh, one of the privacy regulators in the EU who talked about having the level of uh, fines for violations of privacy law to reach the same level as, say, antitrust law. So that would be 2% of global turnover for the company. You know, when you get to that size of a fine, that's potentially, say, a billion dollars for some of these firms. That makes them stand up and take notice, you know, unless they're a major bank, right? Unless they're one of the top five banks, then, then a billion dollar fine has become a, sort of a cost of doing business. But I think, you know, if you, if you have that level of, uh, yeah. we have to have a very serious conversation. And we have to be able to, to laugh when an agency finds uh, an entity like Google $25,000. Right? I mean, that was one of the examples given in the book. We have to get really numerate about these things, about what, say, is the level of fine that really does lead to deterrence versus what yes. just is, is trivial. Now, you did just mention banks, and that's <laughs> yeah. worth dwelling on because many works in this area, in technology studies generally, are written, um, I don't know if I'd call them solutionist, but they're very practical. They're like, here's a set of problems, here's some stuff we could do about it, we should tweak this and change that. Your book has a little bit of a more magisterial sweep and brings to bear a bunch of your thinking, experience, and views about banks, about wealth inequality, about the system generally that appear to be informing a lot of your more practical solutions. And I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about that. How much is this driven by your feeling that somehow we're in a new gilded age, that the, the deck is sort of stacked in many ways against the poor and the disadvantaged that, that lead you to your prescriptions on the more narrow questions of algorithmic accountability? That is a, a terrific question. And I was actually just discussing this with uh, Virginia Eubanks, who does some work with the New America Foundation on the interface between individuals, say, of low socioeconomic status and automated benefit management systems. Um, and it's exactly along those lines that we can endlessly sort of give individuals new rights to contest or, or to be or to see transparent viewer versions of the records. But if the system is deeply stacked against them, that's not really going to work. I would say that what this book is trying to do is it's trying to do, it has both a short game and a long game. And the short game in chapter five is, how do we reinforce and extend the existing protections that we have in law for privacy, uh, for financial regulation and other areas? So for example, like there's this entity called the Office for Financial Research, which tries to understand what all the major banks and what a lot of the, the systemically important financial institutions, SIFIs, are called. Um, maybe they should be called systemically dangerous, not important, but in any event, however you want to call them, <laughs> it tries to keep track of them. Now there are some people that I follow who just say, oh, the OFR is just window dressing. It doesn't really matter because whenever the government finds out about these banks, the banks are going to find a new way to arbitrage around it. Okay. Now, I don't, I really try hard in the book not to indulge in that level of fatalism. In my Twitter feed, sometimes I do <laughs> indulge in that level of fatalism, but I, I think in the book I don't. But what I try to also do in chapter six is to say, look, we're going to have continually, we're going to see regulatory arbitrage in, say, other, many of the fields that I discuss until we have a whole new paradigm. And that paradigm might be sort of uh, making the web less reliant on advertising and personalization via advertising. Like, that may be the root cause of all of the privacy harms. Which, in turn, of course, could exacerbate wealth inequality because if it's not advertising, it might be pay-per-click or pay-per-view. Yes. Sure, sure. No, I, I have no doubt. I mean, that's, although I would, I would say that Nathan Newman's work is a really interesting sort of commentary on, on the degree to which, you know, how much we ultimately know about how free as a business model is helping different socioeconomic groups. Yeah. I mean, I think that, and we also have to think about short and long-term effects, right? In the short term, 
Uber might be a really fantastic thing for cab drivers. I, you know, but in the long term, is concentration of power in one sort of Silicon Valley company that good for them? But I would say that, yes, chapter six is about the new vision. Chapter six is about, the final chapter is about how do you get to a new vision of things? And part of my vision is say, don't just tweak around the edges credit scoring, to come back to an example that we gave, but let's have a policy of experimentalism where we have some public credit scoring systems and the government mandates that say a certain percentage of loans be given out according to them. Or we have more public finance and more encouragement for public finance rather than expecting everything to be sort of done via private finance. So I mean, I just came from this conference at Yale called Innovation Beyond IP, where Fred Block, uh, the sociologist and lots of legal scholars were discussing how the state funds innovation and promotes innovation in many different ways. And I think that's what, you know, the, the, the flip side of my critique of the financial crisis is to say that we need to complement a lot of private finance driven investment by a recommitment and a fair, open, honest political accounting of how the government could improve that. And just to give, if you'll, you'll forgive me for one really concrete example of that, I mean, I think of an example where, you know, you have the government, in order to make it seem as though housing policy is a product of the private market, devolved so many responsibilities to these rating agencies, right? And they did that in this sort of, it's like they're both public and private. They're sort of these nationally recognized statistical rating organizations, so they're public, but ostensibly they're making private judgments. But you know, in the end, what you often see in this field and in so many of these public-private partnerships are the worst of both worlds. Right? And that's, I think, is really problematic. And so that's why the last chapter of the book is more about experimentalism and about sort of like Jim Manzi's book, Uncontrolled, describes a lot of really interesting experimentalism in government. And I try to make the case for that, that we should be experimenting yeah. with new forms of credit, new forms of search engine ranking and rating, or things like that. It's just a very interesting voice at this moment in our kind of cultural history where confidence in government may be, if not at uh, perigee, somewhat <laughs> low, and the usual rhetoric on both left and right is, get the government out of the way as much as possible so that the private sector can innovate. And that's not the tune you're humming. So. No, no, I think my tune is much more, let's be honest about how deeply government influ has influenced and continues to influence the economy, and let's have an accounting as to where it's going right and where it's going wrong. Yeah. Got it. Um, Last question before we uh, open it up. So Federal Search Commission, you've had some time to think about it. Would you want to see Congress create something called a Federal Search Commission, which would be a building full of people that would do what? <laughs> well, that is, a, that is a, um, quite a hostile question. No, <laughs> no, I, here's, so that's the history of the Federal Search Commission as an idea. And I think this will this will be fun to, to sort of talk about you know how ideas come in the academy and how they you know spread. And this is the home or the former home, I guess, of Elizabeth Warren, who had the fantastic idea about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I'm sure that you know lots of folks when they heard about that just sort of laughed and said, you know, how is a bank, how is a loan like a toaster? You know, they don't seem totally. They, you have a Consumer Product Safety Commission. How can you say that its model should be a model for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? But now what we see is that this entity, CFPB, is probably the most vital of the financial regulators in our space, right? And I think that similarly, with this idea of the Federal Search Commission, it came out of actually a, uh, my side of the thinking of it, came out of this, uh, initially this Yale conference called Reputational Economies of Cyberspace. And they had another conference on search in 2005 or so, where there were all these people that were just so excited about Google, and so excited about this new way of ordering things on the web. And my approach was, I just furiously was taking notes and thinking, I think there's so much of the story we don't know. And over the past 10 years or so, a lot has been revealed through, say, leaked Federal Trade Commission reports or through uh, the EU antitrust complaints and others, where I think that we have uh, two problems have been discovered. One is that many times the internet intermediaries, and I'm not just talking about search engines, but other large intermediaries, are organizing our perception of reality in ways that we can't really understand. And this includes your, you know, your complaint about Facebook and sort of its ability to spike the feed to, to get certain people to vote. And the second is a problem of regulatory capacity, which is that a lot of the folks who are supposed to be regulating this don't have access to what they need to have access to in order to give us a convincing account of whether certain laws have been respected, such as Federal Trade Commission laws, which require the disclosure of sponsored content. I don't think they have the regulatory capacity to do that right now. And in 2010, because of the sort of harsh response to the 2008 article, 
I downgraded the Federal Search Commission idea to an internet intermediary advisory council. Okay, so, so at least you'd have some type of entity that had just a, the, an advisory role, you know. But given the latest, latest developments, I mean, I would frankly be pleased to see it come about. I'd be pleased to see something. We're back like, to the commission. Yes, yes, we're back to the commission. And I would be pleased to see it come about because. They actually established it in Europe for the right to be forgotten, right? They have like some search commission. Uh -huh. So the I mean, Europeans? The, no, Google established it. Oh, an advisory council. I, that does not sound like the kind of advisory council Frank has in mind. <laughs> I mean, it's coming around to yeah. I mean, I do feel that there are that there, there's a certain range of problems, and I think that the, the the sponsorship disclosure is one of them. And you know, looking at Danny Sullivan's tone on this type of issue over the years, he's he's around search engine land, marketing land, other things. He originally was extremely sympathetic to Google and sort of felt like people like me were sort of uh, paranoid, perhaps. I mean, he didn't ever call me paranoid, but you know, he, he felt that the critics were being paranoid and thinking that there's, you know, that there is, a, there potentially is a breach in the wall of separation between um, editorial and advertising or between organic search and paid search, et cetera. But I think if you look at the literature and even his blog and Marketing Land and other entities, Worries, there's worries that are starting to show up. And so I think that there, you know, if we are open to a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, there's a whole new government agency. And remember, all the arguments that are being levied against, say, having a new agency here, could be levied against the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I think. Um, you could say, oh, that duty is just part of the Fed duty, or that should be the state's duty, or that should be some other entity's duty. I think similarly you could talk about it here. And I really urge everyone to sort of take a look at the, the, the evidence that is, say, in the European context, in the American context of some of these antitrust problems. But so, the remit of this yeah. thing would be what? What would the authority of this commission be? What would it be enforcing what would it do or not do? I mean, I think that, well, I mean, chapter three of the book has a lot of, you know, characteristic problems that are, you know, I think part of what, it, what yeah. would be its remit. But I just think that it is, it's time for us to realize, I think, as a society that the people that we have empowered to do a lot of the regulation of privacy and antitrust and unfair competition law online, that they are heroes to me in terms of how hard they work, given the resources they have, but they need more help. And so, for example, I would take out of, say, the Federal Trade Commission jurisdiction, the stuff about these sort of sponsorship disclosures or other things like that, and have it in, say, this separate uh, commission that would have that duty. Now, maybe you could have an alternate proposal whereby the government gives them more money, you know, to, to run this thing. But, you know, I just think that that's, the same thing goes, by the way, for people that criticize the right to be forgotten in Europe for effectively outsourcing governmental or law-like decisions to a private entity, right? Like, the big, yeah, the big criticism right to be forgotten, right? And I mean, I think I, I, I've, uh, is that you're having a private entity making what are essentially governmental decisions. I don't see how you achieve the end of the right to be forgotten without something like more public consultation and something more like a public entity. And I'm really glad you brought that up, Omar, because, yeah, yeah, but I'm sorry, can we talk, can we, Dave, too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in fact, uh, David uh, Curran, why don't you take the first, uh, Question or reaction? Yeah. Yeah, just on that point, um, if you think about, especially in the US, I'd like you and I have chatted about this, Frank, a bit. The, I, I use the term collision. Uh -huh. um, and whether it's formally outsourced, uh, the vast majority of regulatory work is done by companies. Right. Um, so the, the government can't do these things, it's self, -re self regulation. Um, and, and largely what happened in, in particularly the financial crisis was a failure. Of self-regulation because the, the and it's simply because you can't audit everybody the way that when we file our taxes in a couple weeks we're just being trusted to right. be the government is trusting you to do that in, right. in this case the government yeah. and and part of the challenge uh, for those who work with corporations is um, the people who are well intentioned who are trying to do the right thing on the self-regulatory side are flummoxed so they have a myriad of laws rules from international local state federal. Um, and I see it all the time where they literally don't know where to start. They actually want to do the right thing. Much of the information that, that they need to have to hand, you gave an example of CFPB. Um, companies are begging the CFPB today to regulate and to give them guidance. So by analogy, are you saying, and you should maybe say a little bit about your background, but yeah. are you saying, Frank, bring it on. We need one source of rules, at least for the United States. Let's park it in a commission, and then at least we'll have calculability. We know what we owe. Or is this, there are so many rules to have to comply with 
don't give me more. Well, it's, it's actually twofold, and I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dave Kern. I, um, I work in the risk mitigation side of uh, Thomson Reuters, and I've spent about 30 years, I'm a lawyer by training, but I've spent about 30 years at this intersection between companies trying to do the right thing and trying to solve these problems and the realities associated with what you've described, Frank. And part of it is that um, most people leave it at the end of the driveway, and they say, oh, let's regulate it, and as if that's... Uh, a magical cure, and we see not only do companies struggle with that that are trying to do it, those that are trying to circumnavigate that can figure it out pretty quickly. Um, so part of the challenge is there are so many conflicting rules, and there's there I mean literally volumes and volumes and volumes yeah. of, of laws. So the clarity is what uh, a lot of companies are asking for, saying, "Listen, I'll do whatever you say." Um, I was at a program a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, one of the largest banks in the world, 12% of its population, employee population, is focused on compliance. 63,000 employees <laughs> in the company. So we don't, more is not what they need. Um, it's and the technology. So they have to be able to automate some of that. Well, they have automated. Wait so, a so, minute. Yeah, oh, let me yeah, wait a second. <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm going to address that. I would address so I think, Frank, one of the questions is that yeah. implies when you say algorithm, I think there's this sort of wow, it's a conspiracy theorist. Um, yeah. They're out there to do things. The marketing and sales side of companies are. Uh, they're trying not necessarily to do the wrong thing, but they're actually trying to maximize revenue. These kinds of things. There are all sorts of people inside and outside of a government that are actually trying to figure it out. And so um, uh, you can have a, a, a blue ribbon commission or an outsource. It, the challenge is not uh, like-minded people who want to do the right thing, in my experience. It's actually, what is the right thing and how do you go about doing it? So using these algorithms to actually fix things. Yeah. Um, they try, and there are technologies that do that, but they struggle. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily the focus of the company. They want to spend money on the marketing and sales side versus the compliance side. Got it. But anyway, so that's that's great general premise. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, and, and I think that helps a lot. That that sort of background and perspective. And <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that I wanted to bring up, you know, it was at one of these algorithmic accountability conferences that I thought was such an interesting uh, dialogue. It was between um, Ed Felton and a scholar named uh, uh, Karen Young. And so essentially what, you know, when you meant it, and it was about this question of people and bureaucracies taking care of social problems versus automation addressing the social problems. And to get to this issue of, again, I want to ground it in something really concrete like the right to be forgotten in Google. I've heard from a very high up guy in Google who said, you know, look, we don't have a problem per se with the right to be forgotten, but give us rules to automate it, okay? And <laughs> they said, if we, if we automate it, if we can automate it to the extent we could follow the example, say, of copyright management or other areas, you know, we just want to automate this type of social dispute. And to me, I think that's problematic because that is a type of area where probably you do need some labor to figure out emerging social norms about what's a matter of public concern. Um, other, and I'll give you two. You've got 70,000 requests pending. How much time, how much person power are you thinking is going to go into each request? How many yachts do the founders have? Not enough to house. <laughs> are you they sure? Have you tossed it out? Have you tossed it out? This Look is just like here. a full employment act for lawyers then, because you'd be hiring hundreds of lawyers who just like, all day, that's what they're doing, right? I think that it is very important. Now, the same thing that you stated here, uh, Jonathan, Yeah. the credit bureaus, I'm sure, said that in response to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I'm sure they said, look at this ridiculous but new law that's going to be Act burdening us with all of this lawyers and all these disputes, et cetera. I mean, but the Fair Credit Reporting Act is generally asking ministerial functions of them. The question of, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, this is a standard, not a rule, it's vague, that's not a FICRA problem. And, and I would say generally, once the rules are... It is a forgotten problem. Yeah, but I would say that generally, once the rules are set in this context... It should then be clearer. It should be clearer. So you lay off most of the people you hired to make the hard calls. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. You know, yeah. Perhaps that's how it ends up. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's... You know, we have social learning. I mean, we have, we have learning over time, and that we can essentially encode into automation some of the easier lessons. You know, So if you look at Julia Powell's work, she's looked at a lot of the cases that have come up and right to be forgotten. And she... You know, there's a case where... A woman's husband was murdered 25 years ago, and whenever anyone searches on her name, that's the first result on her name. She doesn't want that to be the first result. I think it's, you know, on Google. She doesn't get rid of all record that the husband was murdered. You know, it's just she got that and off. And the answer yeah. to that, if it were in a European framework, yeah. is a lawyer better able to answer? Like, as you put it, more like a norms expert 
And what is a norms expert? Well, I do, do know that, juries? I do realize that at Harvard, you know, y'all y'all are very much into legal tech and you're very much into, you know, having automation and forms of software replace, say, lawyers' human judgment. But I would say, you know, in the project that I've been an odd <laughs> calumny, but <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean I follow the work. I mean I follow the work on I follow the hashtag legal tech on Twitter. I mean I follow a lot of these evolutions. And I think that, you know, if you look back to the history of the professions and works like Andrew Abbott's The System of the Profession or Elliot Friedson on professionalism, the third logic, you've always had software based experts trying to displace Doctors, but the puzzle teachers, here, that, that's a and template that's, of, um, there's a clear area of expertise exercised by a human mm -hmm. for which maybe there's a computer substitute. Here, I'm just trying to identify what is the area of expertise. Um, how, about defamation, how about defamation law determining whether something's defamatory? So but the that's right to be the forgotten as far, I mean, that is clearly a legal judgment. It's something defamatory, except to the extent you have to figure out if it is true. No, no, but I was going to say, though, about, I was going to give an example, a concrete yeah. example, which was being gay. Okay, so being gay, there was a case, famous defamation case from the 60s or so, yes. where someone said, all the salesmen of the Neiman Sachs are gay, or the Goldman, so, not the Goldman, the, 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 what's Sachs with that? Neiman Marcus. That's <laughs> I know now that, now, that the, now that the department stores have all are, 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 I've started even forgetting their names, but they, they said they're all gay. Okay, and so the judge decided, wow, that's per se damaging information. Okay, I think there have been recent cases where people have been called gay, and it's been thrown out precisely on the ground that it, being gay isn't a big deal. But anymore. that still strikes okay, me that's as illegal. easier than the question of. It's easier to the determine death the of the woman's husband be right. pushed down as a result but, but in a search for her name. Can I just push back against that? Are you oh, could we have uh, are give you the mic to Omar? Because I'd love for him to introduce himself. Sure. Too. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you, and I'm asking you a question actually, are you suggesting this that. This is called the role reversal part yeah. of the <laughs> session. <laughs> that, so. No, but yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I just I, want to ask if they're it. playing devil's advocate or actually arguing that we should just. Or if let, I'm actually evil, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Uh, are, are you suggesting that we should just let the algorithms kind of churn the data and reach decisions without any due process whatsoever and whatever the machine no. kind of decides we live with it? Uh, I'm because not. Because of scale problems or automation. Uh, I'm thinking it's time to revisit a lot of this stuff. So I'm not feeling smug that everything is very obvious and like just let it alone, we're done here. I do find myself cherry of a scheme like the ECJ's right to be forgotten scheme. And um, I've debated it uh, at length and I gave a talk last week that meshes a lot with uh, what Frank is saying now. Um, that does have to do with if we're asking for a certain judgment to be made for which the criteria are necessarily pretty vague about when to remove that link between search engine and result and when to leave it. And my, my claim is far more vague than is X defamatory, either in a certain instance or structurally in your example of uh, the gay uh, case from the 60s, that I'm not even sure what human would have what qualifications to answer that. What, what should be in the job description must know about norms. Must have lots of life experience. So, so it's like, well, I majored in life experience. You know, that's. Could, could um, we start an LLM program on this, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> I love how Frank is keeping <laughs> to want to get the Berkman Center really into this <laughs> business in some way. But uh, I'm still not moving a car off that lot. Let's get a bunch of comments in because now this is the moment of the session where everything's exploding. So we should <laughs> make the most of it. And that means uh, being succinct, brief, and crisp. Bruce. Uh, Bruce Schneier. So I, I love your book. I think it's a great contribution. Oh, thank you. And when you look at uh, algorithmic accountability, there are two pieces. There, there's the data, and then there's the processing. Back in the 70s, Fair Credit Reporting Act really looked at the data. The processing was very simple, and uh, algorithmic um, accountability was data transparency. And you talk a lot about algorithmic transparency. The algorithms are getting more complicated. We need to know what the algorithms are doing. It's not just the data. It's, it's how it's being processed. I worry about the future, that we're living in a more unique time where the algorithms are knowable. We're getting more algorithms designed by computers, designed by computers, designed by computers. And when Google says, I don't know how this algorithm works, and there is no human readable form of the algorithm to look at. Because the algorithm itself has evolved in it's micro it's ways evolved over algorithm. time. How do we deal with, with algorithmic accountability in the age of no algorithmic transparency? Excellent. And just to, uh, I'll ha I have a quick response and a longer response. But I mean, 
My quick response is that the work of Christian Sandvig and his team on algorithmic auditing, I think is very interesting, and bringing the concept of disparate impact back in is going to be kind of critical, because I think that we need to be able to reserve as a society the right to reject the use of algorithms, no matter how good they are for, say, profit maximizing purposes, if it turns out that they are, say, systematically downranking, degrading the reputations of hurting, say, certain minority groups in society. And I think that's one early example that, you know, um, uh, folks like Barocas and Selbst in their article, Big data and disparate impact have gotten into. I think in the larger sense, though, I do really worry about the HALA 9000 problem, or the sort of the HALA problem where we don't understand what this supercomputer is, is where, the, where it's taking us. And one of the, the, my new project is on automation, and it's particularly looking at, say, the use, one, well, one chapter is looking at, say, the use of these types of systems in war. It may, we can envision a future where, essentially, you've got to use this type of system to model what the other side's drones are going to model, what our drones are going to, you know, et cetera. That's very scary to me. I thought War Games documentary was terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew you, Broderick? Yeah. yeah. But you had Gabriel uh, Bloom and um, Singer here, right? Or, or uh, Ben Wittes here. I mean, the their new book, The Future of Violence, is really interesting on these types of yeah. issues. So, But I'll let more questions. Come. I know. Yeah. Yes. Feel free to tell us who you are if you like. Hi, Frank. Good to see you. So see you for others, um, I'm Dan Gilman. I'm visiting here from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, uh, I should say that my question does not necessarily reflect the curiosity of the Federal Trade Commission. Right? But it might. <laughs> Commissioners. Um, <laughs> but um, so maybe you know already where some of this is coming from. I'm going to uh, partly try to just share some of my deep-seated sure. sense of uh, limitation. Uh, and um, so I'll think about a few things. One in antitrust is the difficulty of doing anything intelligent about uh, uh, prospective uh, markets or anything very uh, far down the horizon. Another is an old 30 some odd year old uh, George Stigler article about uh, both concerns about surveillance and privacy and costs of uh, different forms of uh, privacy regulation. Another touchstone to date myself, I mean, if you've thought about algorithms, maybe you know this old uh, book by a computational uh, neuroscientist named David Marr from the 80s. Uh, so it's got a sort of tripartite approach. There's a theory, a uh, level of theory, computational theory for a complex system. There's a level of uh, algorithm. And there's a level of implementation. So for a cash register, we want the thing to do sums. It's got to be commutative, et cetera. Then maybe we have the algorithm. We start over on the right. We add two numbers. We carry, blah, blah, blah. Finally, we can have switches or this or that, right? I'm, I mean, I find this stuff astonishing in a good way and an astonishing in a troubling way. In the troubling way, I, I, I think is really b very basic. One way to put it is I'm fairly well astonished uh, that you think we know enough about the CFPB uh, to say that it has been and will be an ongoing success and a net benefit uh, to American consumers. I have seen no, I mean, I know a lot of good people have gone over there. I've seen no intelligent overarching research to uh, substantiate this idea. And in the level of computational theory, all right, I'm pleased to have the FTC do less, and especially if it comes out of the consumer protection side, who cares? Uh, but uh, uh, so you're going to give this stuff to a new agency, a nascent agency. I, I want the computational theory here. What exactly are they supposed to do and under what constraints? And I mean, it's easy to talk about like this could go wrong, that could go wrong, but there are costs and benefits on the side. And the more abstract you make this about algorithms and data, the more I wonder what the heck they're exactly going to do, especially as you insert more and more human judgment into this. Is this going to be like the public policy part of FT FCC deliberations? What's going to happen here? Right. So, I mean, I guess my, my quick response would be that, you know, the book is sort of a condensation in some ways of a lot of articles where I look really closely at specific disputes that are, say, in uh, over sponsorship disclosure, over privacy, over antitrust. And I would say, you know, one very practical example of what could be, say, a, 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 this, an entity like this with technical expertise in this area would be, if we take a look at, for example, one of the proposed commitments by Google to the EU in the context of its antitrust case, it was that uh, the, the worry was that Google was privileging its own properties, say, and not really disclosing enough that they were its own properties in some search results. And so they said to the Europeans, hey, maybe we could, and this, I think this was a commitment that was proposed by Google, not by somebody within, but you know, they sort of said, 
we could put three different entities on the search page that are not Google-owned properties, right? Now, of course, that's susceptible to all sorts of gaming. That's going to be a very difficult remedy to monitor, whether that's been done in good faith or in bad faith, et cetera. I totally agree with that. But where we part, I think, is where I have a faith in the ability of, say, something akin to the common law system, the regulatory system, et cetera, to deal with this type of ambiguity and to make decisions, some hard, there'll be some wrong decisions along the way. What I'm hearing is the upshot of your view is that essentially what is being done now is what must be done in the future. And I think this sort of profound conservatism about the ability of society to... And read my 2010 article from Northwestern. I mean, read the piece, Rankings, Reductions, and Responsibility. I'm happy to send those along. I mean, I think I've given many examples about sponsorship disclosure, about giving rival entities places on the first page so it's not all Google properties, um, about making sure that the paid ads and the unpaid ads are, we know exactly, uh, we can distinguish between which, which of the ads are sort of being driven by commercial considerations that may not be driven directly by, say, the user, quality of user experience. In the privacy context, understanding, for example, does Google keep uh, or do these entities keep dossiers based on sensitive health information? Does Facebook know, for example, everybody who's depressed or might have searched for depression? Is that kept in a certain file or not? I would certainly like to know that. <laughs> And you, know, you may be comfortable living in a society where we have no idea whether these dossiers are being kept or we have no way of essentially leading to some forms of accountability if they are. But I live, particularly teaching in the health law world, in a pervasively regulated environment of healthcare where essentially, even though there are many problems with breaches, there are many problems with privacy, we are at least trying to make headway on behalf of patients. And that's why I'm on the advisory board of patient privacy rights. That's why I work with the Electronic Privacy Information Center. It's because I believe that sometimes things reach an inflection point. And I think we saw that, say, in American history with the New Deal. We saw it with the Great Society. We should see it now with respect to a lot of these digital entities. Let's keep uh, the questions coming. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your book. Uh, Hillary Robinson, I'm uh, with MIT STS, and I have a law degree from this school. Um, so we see in the context of this conversation how difficult it is to, to sort of present whole cloth solutions to the problem. And you made some reference to existing bodies of law, like the First Amendment, and of course, Eugene Bollock's article about uh, Google search results being a form of corporate speech. And I wanted to just introduce um, that maybe we should be having a conversation as well about EULAs or user agreements of any kind, because it seems like these entities have attempted to structure that transaction as a form of contract. And there's a conversation we could have about accountability, uh, or rather about unconscionability more specifically. And so most of us click through those things. I mean, that I just feel like should be a part of this conversation, because it seems that like an active attempt to create a transactional relationship. I mean, the user itself is a new thing versus you know, the, this sort of one-to-one -one transaction where we exchange something. So I think in the context of users and, and data not really being clear whether that's a, a product that I'm exchanging in, uh, you know, for the benefit of using a search engine and so on. Uh, yes, oh no, it's a wonderful question. And I mean, I think that, I think there is another area, and it's a, it's a great transition from the last the point of discussion, because I think we need to move from thinking about these things as forms of contract, particularly when the entities involved have hundreds of millions of customers, to one that is a, a form of administrative law. I mean, essentially, especially when you have entities that insert unilateral modification clauses, which you know Margaret Jane Radin has exposed to brilliant effect in her work on boilerplate. Um, when you have these unilateral modification clauses, you essentially have an entity declaring a form of sovereignty over the interactions that the EULA is ostensibly contractually governing. And we really have to be able to step back and say, no, this is a form of administrative law. They're imposing, and you know, as someone that you know knows about the administrative, or as someone that you know, I admire the efforts by the Administrative Procedure Act and these other um, acts to regularize agency action, I think that they are uh, needed here. And one thing that I would state, too, about, say, the ideological valence or non-valence of, of my book, you know, some people say, oh, this is just this, this lefty version of, like, bring back the New Deal, bring back these entities, et cetera. I would say if you look back to the Administrative Procedure Act, a lot of that was driven by Republicans who were upset by unaccountable agency action in the, uh, under the New Deal. Okay. And so I feel like recently we've had entities grow to a size and level of importance, like the banks, like the large internet firms, that that concentration of power is similar in my mind 
to the concentration of power that was achieved by many of the entities under the New Deal. So when I say have something like the Administrative Procedure Act for something like a Facebook terms of service or something like the banks, uh, the, the terms that they impose on us, I hope that folks realize that this ultimately has roots in what I believe are Hayekian principles about, say, the distribution of power. You know, I don't think that uh, the, 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 the true libertarianism you know, plausibly, properly understood should be exclusively concerned with the power of the government. Sometimes there are entities that achieve a sort of power that is quasi-governmental. And I think to that extent, we have to totally reconceptualize EULAs as not really being contracts. You know, they, and I would say, I'll be ready to consider the EULA a contract when somebody at Facebook responds to me when I send them my proposed modifications. Okay? <laughs> if anybody at Facebook is going to respond to my proposed modifications and say, oh, well, we'll take that, we won't take that, etc., of course not. You know, but, that's why, but, but that, again, is not justified, I think, by any sort of normative principle. It's just justified by what I talk about in Chapter 6 of the book, which is the drive for speed, spale, scale, and speculation. And the drive for speed and scale in these automated industries is ultimately a byproduct of financialization and pressures towards speculative gains. It's not a byproduct of anything natural to the automated processes. Hi, I'm, my name is Ron Newman. A long ago, I worked for what considered itself to be a Google competitor, which was called Northern Light, back when there were Google competitors. Um, <laughs> yes, those were the days. But that's, <laughs> that's actually leading into my question, which is, I'm going to make up some numbers here. Let's say Google has 70% of the market, Bing has 25%, and DuckDuckGo has one. I, those are probably fairly accurate, but I don't know for sure. Um, at what level would your proposed Federal Search Commission stop regulating, you know, basically how small does something need to be to fall below the level of regulatory scrutiny? And if there is a, a barrier of this kind, is it a, does it have the intended or unintended effect of encouraging entities to stay, to stay just under that barrier so that they avoid that regulation? I mean, I think the Small Business Administration might be really happy about that. But I, I'd say that, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you could have the, the, the trigger could be, 10% uh, of the market, 15, 20%. I mean, I, I do think that we could work those out in, we could work out the details, um, you know, as this, you know, in the legislative process. Um, you're, you're, now, one of the critiques that has been levied against the book, say, from the left, is someone like, or against the ideas in the book, would be from, say, Evgeny Maratsov, who says, essentially, all this stuff is natural, naturally monopolistic, right? He says that, like, the best search engine is just going to be the one that has the most data. It's naturally monopolistic. And I, you know, I, I, I struggle with that idea, but I think that, ultimately, I'd love to see alternatives sort of grow and flourish. And I think that, you know, that's, Part of that, and actually to the extent that the regulation is only affecting the big guys, then by comparison, hopefully it will uh, encourage the development of the smaller ones that might not necessarily have that regulation. And I think all throughout law we have examples of where regs only come in at a certain level, like the systemically important financial institutions. And I know that you know, MetLife has been battling for uh, years not to be named a systemically important financial institution. So I know there's going to be contestation there, but I'm st I think it's a good contestation. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Um, just going off that a little bit, um, Rowan Current from Forrester Research. Um, what about looking at all of the other algorithms, not just the customer or um, consumer facing algorithms that are used to companies? So you said set a threshold of the very large companies, the ones that will have to be regulated by this board. What about all of the uh, next best action and predictive algorithms used internally and for things that are not essentially uh, credit services? So, like, uh, matching customer service personnel to people that might have matching personalities so they uh -huh. are able to get along together. But that might actually change the way that you buy the services and impact your economic situation. Where would you draw the line there? Um, and just with respect to the algorithms being black box or white box, do you think that neural networks on supervised learning should be regulated more heavily than sort of standard k-means that you can look inside the algorithm itself? Or? Excellent questions. These are really getting some, and so let me let me start with the pa the voice matching thing because I want to lay out the facts of that a little bit more for the audience because I think it is a really interesting element of this, which is, you know, apparently, you know, when you call your bank or you want to talk about something with your account, they'll say this call is being monitored for quality assurance, and you might assume that the quality assurance that they're the quality they're trying to assure is the interaction between the customer service representative and you as you talk with them, but apparently also they keep a voice print, or at least there's, there's about 30 to 60 million voice prints of individuals as they are talking on the phone. And these voice prints are sometimes very 
uh, powerful in terms of being anti-fraud devices, right? So instead of having someone, so they could detect, for example, if someone with a voice much higher or lower than mine tries to call in and take over my account, okay? That could be a very good use. But I would have two responses to it, though. One is that the initial idea behind, or the initial disclosure, was not adequate to create that voice print, right? I think that it's inherently misleading for them to have said, this is for quality assurance purposes. I, don't, I think that was not really a valid consent. This gets a bit to the, a bit to the EULA point, right? This is very close to the EULA point, I think. Um, and I really worry about the security of these voice prints, and I worry about, say, government uh, commandeering of the voice prints. So I think there's so many things that these things sort of generate that we haven't had a real societal discussion over. Um, in the medical context, when you look at the transition to a learning healthcare system, there are many hospitals which have essentially started to use clinical data as research data. They're melding clinical and research data. This is the vision of, say, Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative. I mean, the eventual vision. It's the initiative. It's the vision of the 2007 IOM report on the learning healthcare system. These are good things, profoundly good things, I think. But again, consent, we have to think, really rethink the nature of how that's consented to and how people agree to it and the rights that people have to assure security of that data and to assure non-misuse of the data. So to talk about sort of that internal, that's sort of the first step. The second is, should people know about this type of voice parsing, voice matching sort of thing? I think, I think the company should make it public that they are doing that. Um, now you're talking about more about the internal business processes. You know, again, we get we raise some of maybe the disparate impact concerns. You know, you can easily imagine certain voice prints being big data, certain big data driven matching process matching, say, a voice print to a likely earnings over time. Um, certainly, think about English accents. I imagine one could do that pretty easily, right? The different accents within different parts of, of the UK. Um, and I think that that's another concern that you know would have to be um, explored and developed. Now, your point about the neural net and sort of the, the the systems that are learning over time from themselves, or learning from say, or the, not only are the systems sort of testing. A, B testing, but they're devising, say, the A, B tests to do, that sort of a thing. Yeah, I do think that does deserve extra scrutiny. I think that we do deserve, we do need to have some way of humanly understanding what that process was and how that process is evolving. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in the book, you talk about sort of three types of secrecy. There's sort of real secrecy, legal secrecy, and obfuscation. Uh, so this is a question from our, our Twitter feed from Casper uh, Bowden. Uh, given that organizations have an incentive to obfuscate profile parameters uh, of individuals, how would you define sort of a right to know in an intelligible form? Like, what would that look like? A right to know how one has been profiled? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would say that um, part of this is about ensuring that certain sensitive information is uh, made accessible to you and that you know when a certain sensitive, cl sensitive classification has been made. So, you know, just to tell people, open up the data and take a look at it, that probably is not going to help too much. But the sensitive information, I think, is helpful. I think we also have to have, we have to start enlisting algorithms and bots and automated processing information on the side of privacy. So for example, you know, I'll give another really concrete example from the healthcare context. In high tech, the 2009 Act, you are given the right not merely to your medical records, but to an accounting of disclosures, okay? So you're given the right to know who looked at your medical records, right? Now, hospitals hate this. And hospitals have been agitating against HHS developing, promulgating regulations for years, in part because they say, look, for an ICU visit of a month, there might be 40,000 touches of the record. And when there's 40,000 touches of the record, how is that at all useful information to someone that was in the ICU to get that accounting of disclosures of their record, okay? Now, I believe that the answer to that has got to be an automated processing of it or the empowerment of individuals to have some way of, say, giving that record or they suspect something has gone wrong to an entity that could look for, say, problematic touches of it. Maybe there's one touch of it that's from someone who doesn't work in the ICU. One touch of it from someone that's never been in the ICU before until that patient is there. Things like that. I do believe that just as much, and that's one of the other really important um, efforts to cure asymmetries of information in the book. I think so often, you know, when a lot of the companies involved will say, if, if a new client were to say, I need this new data processing system, they'd be like, yep, we're on it. We're going to get it done in three months. But suddenly when a regulator asks for it, it's like, 
oh, that'll take years or maybe more. You know, and I think that that's where we have to start being more challenging. We have to sort of really be willing to push back and to say, um, is that really the case? And to have folks that have deep technological backgrounds within the regulatory environment to be able to do that. I have more that I'll respond to Casper on Twitter afterwards. Uh, he's a very interesting voice on Twitter on, on privacy issues. Yeah. We're uh, going to close, by the way, by 1.15. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'll try to make this fast then. Hey, uh, Alex Howard, nice to meet you in person. Oh, yes. Hi, Alex. Great. Uh, so uh, two-part question. Um, one, uh, just maybe just context. You know, the FTC now has an Office of Technology Research and Investigation. It seems like in the current political climate, that's probably the closest thing that we're going to get. Mm -hmm. I mean, this current you know, Congress doesn't seem to have a lot of appetite for creating a new government agency. Um, given that, uh, however, a lot of the times these investigations are opened up um, because of uh, journalists finding issues, right, where yes. they're seeing something, differential pricing and staples, that those kinds of things. Um, but there's a tendency towards criminalization of forensic criminal, uh, forensic computer research by journalists or researchers. How would you respond in terms of enabling people to do the kinds of investigations that demonstrate harm, um, in terms of, of kind of getting that into the public record? And then the second part of this is how much of this should apply to government? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of algorithmic transparency. You can see, you can imagine automating the kinds of, of regulation you're talking about, but if someone, say, puts in something to see what's happening in high-frequency tra trading, or say here in Massachusetts there's an issue with the food stamp software, sure. um, you know, to what extent should the regulators uh, regulation through you know, algorithms be open to the people that are being governed? And can I actually ask the speaker's prerogative and just ask, like, I, I, those are wonderful questions, and I'm going to get to them, but Amar, do you, before you leave, did you want to have a little question, or do you? Yeah, I did have a question. Oh, do you mind if I, because th th this is a question from someone that really inspired some of my finance side of the book, and so I <laughs> wanted to get it, yeah. So, uh, if you, if you, tell us who you are. I'm Amar Bide, I've, I've written a book on, on the use of judgment in finance, so, uh, and so I think we have both agreed more judgment is better than less judgment in, in finance. Uh -huh. Generally, I would submit that at least in finance, more judgment means more information, generally. And the big problem with credit, uh, credit scoring and credit extended based on credit scores is not too much information, but too little information. Ah. That each time someone is, I mean, all, all the examples that you cited of so-and-so being rejected for, uh, as a bad credit when in fact that person was a good credit was because a certain vital amount of information was omitted. Now, if you ask the question, why have we gotten to a, uh, a financial system where so much information is omitted, which, which leads to type 1 and type 2 errors, part of it is new technologies, but equally part of it is uh, regulation, which also does not exercise judgment in, 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 in looking at things like disparate impact. So uh, would you, in order to encourage more judgment and in, to, in order to encourage the greater use of information, also then uh, get rid of or, or dilute uh, the crude estimations of, of bias that, that, that come around through disparate impact and have a more judgment-based, common law-based uh, evaluations of whether uh, bias has uh, been, uh, whether the lending has been extended in a biased way or not? Well, these are three tough last questions. Okay, <laughs> so let me start with Alex, and I'll get. To, well, actually, maybe I, if you have to leave for class, I'll start with you, <laughs> which, which maybe that I I've got to think more deeply about the analogy between automation and bureaucracy, and I think that that analogy is one of the most challenging ones. The the analogy between say the way that automated systems do things and the way that the the barbarian tendency of bureaucracy is toward a form of rationalization that is insensitive to uh, conditions and to history. And I would say part of my work with the Council on Big Data Ethics and Society is exactly along the lines of bringing history back in and, under, and understanding that the data are never like just given. Despite the etymology of data, data are never just given. They always have a history. We have to always be sensitive to that. So I, I will definitely be thinking in that direction. In response to Alex's questions about the, you know, first applying this to government, absolutely. I mean, my um, co-author, friend, um, someone I admire greatly, Daniel Citron, her work, Technological Due Process, is, is all about this application of these types of, um, of new forms of due process and accountability in the government context, for example, with benefit management systems. And I'd love to hear more about the Massachusetts context. With respect to journalists being able to do their job, absolutely, They're, toward the end of uh, chapter five, I talk about um, the 
incredible repression of journalism in the United States, both in terms of like protest journalism, like what happened in the wake of Occupy, but also in terms of um, say ad gag laws, which say criminalize even you know trying to figure out what's happening on a farm, um, to new forms of, um, of of making it very very damaging and risky for a journalist to try to test out various ways. And, and Sandvig, the researcher Christian Sandvig, runs into this as well when he tries to do certain forms of of algorithmic auditing. So absolutely, I think that's got to be a whole other front of the battle for algorithmic accountability. So thanks. Well, one of the uh, points within the book is that uh, transparency alone is often not helpful in these matters, but we want really uh, beyond transparency and into intelligibility. Yes. And uh, I think that can apply to an entire academic field as well. <laughs> and, uh, Frank, I think we owe you thanks for being willing to be such a clarion voice to stake out positions that I think lead towards intelligibility in the sense that they test us, they test our instincts about things. And uh, the one moment we had today where everybody wanted to talk at once <laughs> is a great example of the usefulness of really speaking with such a clear voice about your views on this and to assemble those who agree and those who utterly disagree in order to hash it out and come to more intelligibility about it. So for that, we owe you a huge thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.